welcome to the Cumbria Chamber of Commerce podcast, your weekly update of business news and issues from around Cumbria. Find out how we support new business and help existing businesses to grow and flourish at cumbriachamber.co.uk. Now, here's the Chamber's Business Engagement Manager, Julian Whittle, with this week's episode. Hello, I'm here with Luke Donnickley, a solicitor with Muckle, the Newcastle-based law firm, to talk about how businesses can prepare for Brexit. Luke, one of the frustrations for businesses looking ahead is that although Brexit's due to happen on March the 29th, we still have no no idea whether it it will happen or get delayed, what sort of Brexit we're going to get. So the the refrain we hear from businesses is, how do I prepare? What, 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 What should I be preparing for? How should businesses approach this? Okay, I mean, the obvious thing to do is to prepare for a no deal Brexit. Um, And it's obvious because you plan for the worst and hope Mm. for the best. And we're not Mm. making a political comment when we say Mm. that it's the worst thing. It's just the most disruptive thing. Mm. So I think any business ought to be preparing for Mm. no deal. Now, there's obviously uh, a financial and uh, an opportunity cost involved in preparing for no deal. Um, It'll be more expensive to prepare for no deal because you've got to do it in a short amount of time. Mm. But I think the really important thing to remember is that any of your preparations that you make for a no deal won't be wasted Mm -hmm. simply because if you think about what a no deal is for the purposes of this podcast the no deal is leaving the customs union and the single market on the 29th of Mm -hmm. march obviously it's much more complicated yeah with no transition period. with no transition period Mm -hmm. absolutely now if you look at what the destinations for the uk are post brexit Mm -hmm. they are something like Canada, Mm -hmm. so free Free trade trade. agreement, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Something like Norway, member of the single market and not the customs union. Or if the withdrawal agreement occurs, um, you would end up with um, a bespoke British deal, but Mm -hmm. it would be something like Canada. All of those options involve leaving either the single market or the customs union or both. Yeah. So by preparing for no deal, you're essentially just preparing for an element of our future relationship. And you're getting it done early Mm -hmm. and actually... Doing it early is sensible because you would advise a client you need to spend a year or two getting ready for this in an ideal scenario. Okay. Now, is it worth doing a Brexit risk assessment? And what what would that involve? I mean, it it absolutely is worth doing a Brexit risk assessment, um, simply because any business that truly understands just what a dislocation Brexit will be for Britain Mm. um, will understand the need to do a risk assessment. But actually... The question is quite interesting. It reflects a couple of things I think that are go- that's going on in the business community. So one is this idea of it being um, a risk assessment. Now, of course, change is a risk for business. So Brexit being the change is a risk for business, and a no deal Brexit in particular would be a big change and therefore a big risk. Yeah. But that hides the other side of this which is opportunity and there will be some opportunities for businesses and it's easy to lose sight of that but actually to give some simple examples um, if you have a a particular skill in relation to import and export you might be able to commoditize that if you have spare warehouse capacity that's at an absolute premium now it might help you open up new markets Um, you're not going to know that unless you do some sort of risk assessment. So you're absolutely right to call it a risk assessment, but don't ignore the opportunities. Yeah. The other side of this is is what we mean when we say, is it worth doing it? Worth obviously implies a cost. Yeah. And we've talked about the financial cost of doing this. But if you flip the question on its head and you ask yourself, well, what is the cost to my business of not doing some form of assessment? That could, that could literally be enormous for your business. Um, so really, if you, if you think about it in those terms, you can see that it, it absolutely is worth doing it. Now, what it involves, well, that depends on the nature of your business. And it'll be different for each business. But I think what we can do is try and set down some guiding principles of this is the sort of things that you ought to be thinking about. And um, so I think the first guiding principle is you ought to be setting up some sort of steering group. Um, so that would be ideally drawn from across your business. Um, if you have the luxury of some sort of uh, in-house legal counsel, then they would be included. Most businesses obviously won't. So someone familiar with contract law would be absolutely ideal. It absolutely needs someone at board level um, and then probably someone from HR. Um, then it depends on the nature of your business. Who else is in that steering group? 
it needs to have a clear set of terms of references so the group needs to know what it is that it's engaged to do ideally mm. it would have a budget and um, it certainly needs to be decision making and that will steer the organization's response to what's coming now what it actually prepares for is dependent on where it is we end up now we're saying people should really be preparing for no deal yeah so you're going to have to prioritize there's just not enough time to do proper preparations if you haven't already started the steering group is going to have to think about what the guiding principles of the business are okay so if the guiding principles of your business is perhaps we've got um intellectual property scattered to the four winds across the eu what you're going to be interested in is protecting that intellectual property. So your guiding principle will be, well, how do we go about doing this in the event of a no deal? Perhaps you rely heavily on labour from the EU. How do we secure labour from the EU? How do we keep these people in our business? And then once you've set your guiding principles, really the most important thing, the most business critical thing you can do now is to do an audit of your supply chain. So yeah. most people are involved in the supply chain of some form. I think there is a tendency actually for some companies to say, well, we're not really involved in import or export. Mm -hmm. So Brexit isn't really something that's going to affect us. And I don't think you can repeal 40 years of European mm -hmm. law integration without being affected, even if you don't import and export. Because you might be supplying somebody who does, or you might be supplied by somebody who does. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So you need to ask yourself a series of questions. So things like, at a simple level, do I import or export? You're very obviously mm -hmm. going to be affected. Do I rely on someone who imports and exports? Well, the answer is you probably will do. Um, what exposure to tariffs and excise duties and VAT will we have in the event of a no-deal Brexit? Um, do you rely or do your suppliers rely on capacity of ports, haulage, um, sea freight, air freight? Um, you know, what about warehousing capacity? Do we need to stockpile? If we need to stockpile, do we need to get a short-term business loan? If we need to get a business loan, well, is there some form of credit crunch going on where people can't actually secure business mm -hmm. loans? Well, big banks recently have said, actually, that is something that is happening with Brexit. So these are all things that might happen in your supply chain. But it, it goes much beyond the cost of your logistics. So if you think about things like looking at your suppliers, are your suppliers likely to be forced out of business by Brexit? So... If the answer is yes, I think my suppliers are exposed, you might decide, well, what can I do to help keep my supplier in business? Because you might want to, for example, vary the terms and conditions of your contract to give them some breathing space because it's better to have them than have to find an alternative yeah. supplier. So you might be saying, well, can we increase our delivery times? Can we allow them a little bit of slack? What's the quid pro quo? What would we get out of that if we did it? Um, and I think really importantly, you should be asking suppliers and customers what preparations they've made for Brexit. Don't be frightened to send them essentially a due diligence questionnaire saying, well, what have you done? Because this is not just about what you as a business can do to protect yourself. It's about what the people in your supply chain are doing. And you're obviously going to be affected by that. So you could quite easily inherit someone else's cash flow problems. Mm -hmm. If you can't supply because the supplier hasn't supplied, mm -hmm. there's a reputation risk for you there. And if your competitors get it right and you get it wrong, that's going to be a big problem for you. So I think a business audit is really the business critical thing you can be doing now. I mean, you mentioned uh, employing EU nationals. A lot of businesses in Cumbria do that already. So what, what should they be doing? Well, that's a really important question. There's something like 3.2 million EU nationals living in the UK, many of whom are obviously of, of, of working age. The good news is that in the event of a withdrawal deal, um, there'll be no change. Um, in, in the first couple of years and people who are here will be able to apply for um, what we might call settled status they'll have to do so before the end of the withdrawal deal and the government has under some political pressure I think dropped the um, fee for doing that the problem comes with a, a, a no deal as yeah. much of this obviously does yeah. what happens then is at the minute not a legal question because there isn't an answer to that it's a political question now uh, I'm a legal expert, not a political one, but if I was to take a guess, mm. I'd say that the wind is very much behind allowing people to stay on the same terms that they are here now. So I don't think you'll see people leaving in the event of a no deal at the, the request of the government. There's too much riding on the government. There's too yeah. much goodwill needed. But actually, I think really this is a question of culture 
and economics more than politics and the law. Because if you have to think, what is the culture going to be like in this country post-Brexit? Are we going to have a hostile environment? Now, one would certainly hope not, but there will always be an element of society that might make people from a foreign country feel uncomfortable. Um, anecdotally, you see lots of reports of that in the press. So you might find that people who you rely on decide, actually, the UK is not the place for us. And there's a big economic question here as well, because in the event of a no deal, it's pretty a fair assumption, a pretty fair bet that the UK economy is not going to fare well. You have a look at some EU economies, particularly Eastern European economies, they're doing quite well. So if you're a Polish worker at a Cumbrian factory and you've gained language skills, management skills, skills in, say, logistics or you know, a particular craft, you might very well think, well, actually... My future and my family's future is best served back home and I'm going to leave. So I think in terms of what do you do about your workforce, actually don't worry about the legality of it, don't worry about the political situation. What you really need to worry about is just talking to the people in your business, yeah. finding out what their plans are and trying to make them feel like they've got a future with you. Okay. Now, how do you anticipate that the import and export of goods will be affected? I'm thinking of, you know, of the no-deal scenario. Mm -hmm. What about trade with non-EU countries mm -hmm. that are currently covered by trade deals that the EU's negotiated. Yeah. So this really is absolutely ground zero for most companies. Most companies, when they think of Brexit, will understand something of the importance uh, of Brexit to import and export. But I think what most companies, most people we come across actually don't understand are just actually the technicalities of what are going on here. And to have a meaningful conversation about what trade's going to look like post-Brexit, there's no way around this. You have to talk about what we call the two pillars of Brexit. So they are leaving the single market and leaving the customs union. And if you understand both those things, they're the key that unlock, mm -hmm. the keys that unlock Brexit. So let's think briefly about those first. In its simplest form, the single market is a group of countries that have got together and decided we're going to stay in regulatory alignment. So we're going to have the same uh, laws and regulations about products as every other country in the single market, also known as the EEA, the European Economic Area. There is a single market for services, but we'll talk about goods because I think that's something that people can really get their, get their head around. So to give you a practical example, imagine you are a Spanish producer of widgets, okay? And you think, I want to export my widgets to Portugal. And um, the Portuguese consumer can use your widgets and they can rely on something called the presumption of compliance. So all this means is that they can assume that the Spanish producer has complied with the EU laws on packaging, labelling, the production of widgets, whatever the case might be. Yeah. This is all about removing non-tariff barriers to trade. Okay, so what it means is that in practical terms, when those goods are shipped over the border, you don't need someone at the border opening the shipping container and checking the packaging requirements, the labelling requirements, the health and safety requirements, because everybody knows they know they're going to comply. They know they're going to comply. And on this point, it's worth mentioning just briefly the role of the European Court of Justice in this, mm -hmm. because the ECJ, much maligned though it is, from, purely from a legal perspective, putting the politics of it aside for a moment, is, is, is a quite extraordinary body. It's this supranational court that sort of hovers over the whole of the European economic area and provides companies, individuals um, and governments with a means of enforcing these rules, which incidentally, if we crash out on no deal, mm -hmm. the WTO doesn't provide those. And that's something we'll talk about in a minute. So leaving the single market, you would lose that ability to move goods without checks at the borders. So that's one thing. Worth stating as well that the stated aim of the UK government is to be outside. This is what the withdrawal deal yes, says. Yep. It says we do not want to be in the single market. Okay, And obviously in a no deal, we, we won't be in the single market. So that goes hand in glove with the customs union. So the customs union is, is similar in the sense that it's a group of countries that get together and decide they don't want tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers or quotas. So far, so simple. The neat thing about a customs union is that everybody in the union has to charge something called a common external tariff. So again, in simple terms, it just means everybody has to charge the same tariff for the same goods coming in from outside the EU from a third country. So again, by way of example, imagine you've got a British manufacturer of clothes and an Italian manufacturer of clothes, and they both want to import textiles into the EU. Average textile tariff is 6%, so they've both got to charge 6%. 
Nobody's at a competitive advantage. Interestingly enough, this is why Brexiteers absolutely hate the customs union. Because if you think about it, if you have to charge the common external tariff, then if you are Britain and you want to sign a free trade deal with America, you can't do it. Because what you can't do is say to the Americans, well, we will lower the uh, yeah. common external tariff because that puts Britain at a massive competitive advantage to Italy mm. in that example. And also America at a massive competitive advantage. And that is why, and we'll come on to this in a little bit, all of our free trade deals with third countries are signed by the EU because they have to apply equally to everyone. So we'll be leaving this. And what that means is that we'll have to pay the common external tariff. That means friction at the borders, customs duties, customs paperwork, mm. so on and so forth. So that's the single market and the customs union. So apply that to Britain. How is this going to look in the event of a, 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 a deal or a no deal? Right, yeah. Okay, so let's think about a no deal first. Britain is a member of the World Trade Organization. The EU is separately a member of the World Trade Organization. Okay, so if we were to leave without a deal, and, 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 and let's make this point clear, when we talk about a withdrawal deal, this is nothing to do with the future economic relationship with this country, with the, United, with the uh, European Union. The withdrawal deal, it, it merely deals with things like the divorce bill that we're going to have to pay them to continue to have the same rights for a few years, the rights of citizens mm. and so on. It's not a free trade agreement. So if we leave without a deal, we leave on World Trade Organization terms. Britain is a third country. It has to pay the common external tariff to get its goods into the EU. Now, what does that mean for exporters and importers? Well, the average tariff for the EU is something like 3.2%. It's not, it's not enormous, mm. but then that varies on sector by sector. So the average tari tariff for chemicals is about 4%. For cars, car parts, it's about 10%. Um, for um, petrol, it's 2.5%. Um, and in some circumstances, it can be much higher. It's over 30% for uh, agricultural yeah. products. Yeah. Yeah. Um, of course, nobody pays an average tariff. Everyone pays a tariff. Yeah. So actually, that masks the reality, which is as high as 189% for some dairy products, which is going to put producers out of business yeah. if they're affected by that. And you've also got the problem of crisscrossing of borders. I mean, nowadays, such as manufacturing in Britain, that you might have a part that is made in Cumbria, but then perhaps it's shipped to France to be have a part added to it. And then perhaps that's shipped to Belgium to be finished. And then perhaps that's shipped from Belgium to the Netherlands because it's the easiest way to get from Rotterdam to the port of Tyne and back into Cumbria. But it's crossed a few borders there. And if going into and out of Britain, it picks up possibly several times a tariff, then you get this compound effect of tariffs yeah, yeah. where yeah. suddenly your products become much more expensive. Um, it has been suggested by some people that actually the way to deal with this is just to reduce tariffs to zero. So what people say is that possibly what will happen is um, in the event of a no-deal Brexit, we need goods to be coming into the UK. Let's just reduce tariffs to zero. It doesn't necessarily have to be reciprocal, um, but then we can get the supply of products into this country. Businesses won't have to worry about it and we can move on in a few years' time. The problem with this is that under World Trade Organization terms, they have something called the most favoured nation principle. And again, in layman's terms, all this is, is uh, a rule that says that if you extend a commercial advantage to one WTO member, you have to extend the same advantage to all members. Right. So, so if we said no tariffs for goods coming in from the EU, it would have to be no tariffs on goods coming in from everywhere else. Absolutely correct. Now, yeah. you think about the effect on mm. Cumbria of that. That means Cumbria is flooded with cheap goods from across the world because nobody has to pay any tariffs to get them in. That's going to put massive, massive pressure on importers and on, on sorry, on um, uh, producers yep. in, in, in the country. The effect is much worse, potentially, actually, when you think about regulations because a commercial advantage isn't just lowering a tariff. Imagine if we get rid of checks at the borders. We say, actually, goods coming in from the EU, we don't want to be queues at ports. So all those checks that... Uh, make your products safe and we need to check your products are safe let's forget about those bring your products in we know that EU products are safe and in a few years time we'll put the checks back up we want that frictionless trade what if you extend that advantage to an EU country where you know the products are safe you've got to do it to all WCO oh, members right, right, so yeah. you, you're faced with a situation yeah. where you might find that cheap Chinese electrical goods mm -hmm. come to the country unchecked medicines from India mm -hmm. or uh, 
cheap food and agricultural products from the US come in without all these checks. As, a, as an industrial strategy, it's it's from you know the same playbook as Custer's Last Stand or <laughs> the Charge of the Light Brigade. It's it, 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 it's yeah. not a sensible place for the country to go. So that's the World Trade Organization terms. Now, obviously, if we go out on World Trade, World Trade Organization terms, we're going to be looking to enter a free trade agreement, or we're going to have the withdrawal agreement, and we're going to try and negotiate this free trade agreement. And again, let's underline this. Theresa May's withdrawal deal, deal says that she wants a deep free trade agreement. She wants to be outside the customs union in the single market. So that is where we're headed, unless there's a second referendum. You need to then think about, well, actually, what is a free trade agreement? Well, a free trade agreement looks a bit like a customs union. It's two countries, or in this case, be the UK and the EU, getting together and saying, no tariffs, no taxes, no quotas. That's all very well. The problem with a free trade agreement, which on paper looks great, if you think about it in those simple terms, is something called transshipment, okay? And the EU hates transshipment. So let's think about what transshipment is. Imagine you are an American producer of industrial goods. And you're right next to Canada. And Canada has a free trade agreement with the EU that allows it to export and import industrial equipment, 0% tariff. So you're an American producer and you look at those Canadian producers over the border and you think, they are at a massive competitive advantage to me because they don't have to pay the common external tariff. Whereas our trade deal with the US, the TTIP, Transatlantic yeah. Trade and Investment Partnership, collapsed yeah. um, and we don't have the benefit of it. So American producers pay the common external tariff. So the American producer thinks, well, we've got the benefit of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. So what we could do you ship our components for our industrial products over the border, tariff-free into Canada, assemble them on a production line in Canada, put a made-in sticker Canada on them, export them to the UK, hey presto, we've got our goods mm. into tariff-free, yeah. tariff yeah. into the EU. The Americans have just completely turned the, table on the mm. tables on us because they can export to the EU tariff-free, but they're protected mm. by their own tariffs. Mm. So huge competitive advantage. Clearly, the EU hate this. So what the EU have done is introduced something called rules of origin. So the rules of origin just say 55% of the value of your product mm. has to be added in the country that has the benefit of the deal. So for the Canadian producer, your industrial mm. good, 55% of the value has to be added in Canada. And that stops transshipment. And that's how a free trade agreement works. We'll apply that again to the UK post-Brexit. That means... You are going to have to, as a manufacturer, if you want to take the advantage of a free trade agreement, you're going to have to show that 55% of the value of your product mm. was made in the UK. Now, that's made in the UK, not sourced in the UK. So mm. you might get uh, a part from a, a, a supplier in Coventry mm. or Glasgow or something like that. But where did they get their parts from? Mm. You can start to think about this, if, particularly if you think about sort of more complex things that might have crossed a few borders. You start to think about auditing that. How do I audit that? How do I prove that my product was 55% of the value was added in, in Cumbria? That might actually be staggeringly difficult, difficult. for you. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it comes down to, can you audit it? And what a lot of commentators say is actually faced by that. Big businesses will move because they have the money to reshore in Slovakia or wherever inside the customs union they want to do. The problem is with SMEs because they'll be faced with, can we do this? Mm. If we can do it, can we um, bear the cost of it? Mm. Is it easy just to pay the common external tariff? So even if we've got a benefit for free, free trade agreement, some manufacturers will say, well, we'll just pay the tariff anyway because we actually, essentially, for all intents and purposes, can't be bothered to go mm. through this process. Um, so that's what a free trade agreement might look like. Now, the second part of your question there was about, can we just roll over our free trade agreements? Yeah. If only it was so easy. We can't. For the simple reason that if you think about the way those free trade agreements are drafted at the, at the minute, they say that 55% of the value of a product has to be added in the EU. Now, imagine you were to take that free trade agreement, you were to scratch out the EU and just write in the UK, which is essentially what some people think we can do. It, that agreement would then say, well, 55% of the value of the product has to be added in the UK. Well, most people can't do that because mm. it's not. Yeah. So culturally, as a business community, because we're so 
ingrained in a customs union where we can quite easily get parts from the EU, we don't rely that heavily on British suppliers. Yeah. So that's the first problem we've got. Um, that dramatically reduces the commercial value of the free trade agreement. And you've got to remember that the other countries involved in this, so take you know, Korea as a great example, Korea ships tens if not hundreds of thousands of Hyundais and Kias and Sanyongs and so on into the UK every year. They are used to doing this. And if they, um, well, there are some tricks the government can pull, uh, it, let it be said. So one of the things that they can do is something called diagonal accumulation of origin. Okay. So all this means is that what the, EU, what the UK might try and do is say to, say, for example, Korea, well, actually, we can't add 55% of the value of our products in the UK. But what we can do is guarantee you that 55% of the value of our product is added in either the UK or the EU. Yeah. So you get this cumulative, mm. this triangulation mm. of, of, of agreements. That's fine. But what Korea will say to us is, okay, that's fine as long as you allow 55% of the value of our product to be added in Korea mm. or China. <laughs> Then a Hyundai or a Kia suddenly becomes dramatically cheaper. So there is no simple fix to this. And obviously the other thing to think about is these countries have the UK over a barrel because they've lost one market and we've lost all of our markets. And there's a lot of countries now that are saying, actually, we don't want to trade with you on the same terms. We want to renegotiate. Um, so uh, quite recently, American producers have put, been putting a lot of pressure on the US government mm. to come down hard on our safety standards. They think we have far too high safety standards mm. as part of the EU. They take a much more scientific view. Mm. So great example, everybody's heard of chlorinated chickens. Modern science doesn't tell us that chlorinated chickens are dangerous, but we in the EU don't particularly like the thought of it, so we ban them. Uh, the Americans might say, well, actually, scientifically, there's nothing wrong with it. So they want to drag our mm. standards down. So that might affect our, our future trade deals as well. Now, if we are reliant on WTO tariffs, where, where can businesses find information about the tariffs that might, that would, well, that would apply yeah. in that scenario? Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's two sources of information. One is you can go on the, the WTO website yeah. because the country's got to publish what tariffs mm. it will charge. And um, the other thing that you can do is that gov.uk has a commodity uh, commodity code duty and VAT checker. And you can literally just search on there uh, and it will spit mm. the answer out for you. Good. What, what um, restrictions or, or additional requirements might hauliers, road hauliers face? Yeah. I mean, that depends, as so much does, on whether we get a deal. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, if we get a deal, then for the next couple of years, there won't be much change because that's the point of the deal. You're yeah. paying for the same structures to be in place for the next couple of years. Um, if there's no deal, then some of the documents upon which um, the drivers rely might not be recognised. So there are um, a standard international operators licence. That's probably OK. There's a community licence, which you need to drive in the EU. Um, that might not be recognised. Um, a driver's certificate of professional competence, so-called CPC, that might not be recognised. So um, the drivers themselves might actually have to apply to an EU licensing authority in an EU country in order to get the correct permit. Um, that in itself, I think, is sortable. I think what will happen is um, the government will quite quickly release information that's relatively simple and people will have a process to go through. But we go back to that piece that we talked about earlier about customs checks. Yeah. And really what will happen is that the way in which goods come out of and into the EU will change completely. So if you import goods and if the goods are accompanied, which it, it will be in most cases with hauliers, the haulier itself is going to have to submit safety and security info via something called an, an entry summary declaration. Well, they're going to have to know how to do that. Um, they're going to have to have the um, what they call the, the EORI number of yeah. the importer. Yeah. Um, you're going to have to know that. You're going to have to know how to submit the correct customs paperwork, how to use the, 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 uh, the uh, online portals that the government use. And for exporters, you're going to need to know the registration number of the vehicle. Again, the EORI number. And when an exporter states that it's going to export particular goods, what HMRC will be able to do is say, well, you have to send your haulier to a particular place so that we can check the goods. So it, it really could be all change. And 
on this point, there is a, a, a very detailed uh, technical notice on the gov.uk website. So the government have released hundreds of these covering all aspects of business, uh, and that gives you more information on it. Okay. And what about excise duties and VAT? What changes can we expect there? Okay. Well, excise duties are on alcohol, tobacco, and hydrocarbons. Okay. So goods, alcohol, tobacco, hydrocarbons coming into the EU will be subject to excise duty. Now, this is an interesting question because what a lot of companies have decided to do is stockpile. And there's an obvious cash flow implication to stockpile. You yeah. have to pay for a lot of goods. Yeah. If excise duty is levied on those goods, then there's an extra cash flow implication. So what some companies now are doing is looking to put um, large amounts of goods into duty suspension. So essentially, you bring them into the country, you put them in a bonded warehouse. You don't have to pay excise duty until they enter circulation. So... Uh, that is one way in which businesses can tackle that. VAT is a much more interesting question. VAT certainly won't go. VAT accounted for something like 18% of the UK's tax revenue in 2016-17. It's something like £156 billion. So we can't afford to lose it. VAT, though, is harmonised across the EU. And that's to prevent one country getting a competitive advantage. So, for example, we've talked about how in the customs union there's no customs duty, some countries it was feared would use VAT as a proxy uh, uh, and, and, and gain income that way. So there are a series of things that the, the UK must and cannot do with VAT. And if we leave with a no deal, it'll be open to us to change that. So it's things like um, you can't create, at the minute, new zero rated items. Well, the UK will be able to create new zero rated items. Um, you can't, there's a prescribed list of goods that can be subject to a low rate and the minimum low rate is 5%. Well, you could, you could change that. Um, there's a bracket in which VAT operates. So our VAT's at 20% now, but there's a ceiling and a lower limit. They can that be changed. Yeah. No, that wouldn't apply. Um, and also, you can't have a rate that's higher than the standard rate. So you can't have a rate on luxury goods. Well, the UK could apply a rate on luxury goods. So there's all sorts of things that the, the, the government do could do to give itself a competitive advantage. But worth pointing out that that will only happen in a no deal because in a deal, the EU won't let us do it. They don't want a low VAT regime sitting off the coast of Europe. Yeah. Okay, now... We know some businesses are actually setting up subsidiaries inside the EU to handle their European operations after Brexit. Why would a business do this and is it worth considering? Yeah, again, it, it, it really depends on the nature of your business. So there's some really simple questions you can ask yourself. Um, quite simply, where are your customers and your clients based? So if you're a, a business that, uh, again, say you manufacture goods, and I'm taking it to an extreme here, but let's say 90% of your goods are for the UK market and 10% of your goods are for the EU market. There's not a lot of point probably in you setting up a subsidiary to cater for the 10%. But if you reverse those numbers and say, well, actually, 90% of my goods are based in the, or sold in the EU and 10% in the UK, then do you want to be paying customs duties on 90% or 10% of your goods? There's a very obvious reason for you to set up um, uh, 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 abroad and um, logistics is another big thing a lot of people don't realize just what a stopping off point the UK is between the Republic of Ireland and the EU and, and vice versa so if you rely on that logistics chain you might find that some of your business goes unless you have that chain set up in the EU and there's also some really good regulatory issues and why you might want to be uh, in the EU perhaps uh, your regulators moved from Britain to the European Union just this morning, there was a report in one of the papers from um, the Federation of Small Businesses that said um, the EU are planning to force companies that supply goods into the EU to have uh, an authorised economic operator in the EU. So essentially, someone who is responsible for those products in the EU, you're going to have to pay for that privilege. And that could be hundreds, if not thousands of pounds oh, a year, right. yeah. potentially yeah. per yeah. product. Yeah. Um, I, I think there is... One other thing to think about here as well, though, and, and again, it's a, it's a cultural point. Um, anecdotally, we have heard stories of um, companies based in the EU that don't want to do business with UK companies post-Brexit. Mm. Um, so you might find that offshoring is 
the, the only way to guarantee your business. But but on a on a on a, a narrowly legal point here, just be careful when you think about the difference between a, setting up a branch and setting up a subsidiary. They're very different things. So a branch is an extension of your company yeah. in a foreign jurisdiction. A subsidiary has its own legal personality. Okay. It's its own company, yeah. and to do that, you'll need to take the advice of an accountant or a corporate lawyer. Okay. Now, what about business travel within the EU? Within the EU, how will that be affected? So, in the common travel area, so as as between UK and Ireland, it, it won't be affected. Probably in the event of deal or no deal, um, and in the event of a deal, there'll be no change in the transition period anyway. If we assume for a moment that we get a deal, then there will be some changes at the end of that transition period. So. Um, you'll need at least six months left on your EU passport to get entry into the country. Um, you'll only be able to stay for a maximum of 90 days in any 180-day period. And um, You'll have to be able to prove sub- what they call sufficient means of subsistence. So what that essentially means is if you're travelling to the EU, the EU are going to want to know that you have, for example, a ticket to get out of the EU, um, your accommodation costs and so on, so they might demand to see that. Um, after 2021, what the EU said is that well, we don't particularly want visas to be in place for UK people coming to the EU as long as there's no visas in place from EU citizens coming to the UK. But you will have to register with a Schengen country, so a country in the Schengen area if you want to visit, and that's going to cost €7 Euros mm. and last for three years. So you'll have to do a pre-registration. Um, in a no deal, this is up for grabs, we don't know. We do know that the planes will probably keep flying. Um, the number of f- flights it has been suggested um, will be capped at 2018 levels. So if there were extra demands to put yeah. on extra flights to a particular country, that probably wouldn't happen. Um, driving permits, your driver's license might not be accepted mm-hmm. in um, uh, an EU country. And, and very helpfully, um, not all EU countries have the same um, there are two different, different systems. There are two different systems. Yeah. You'd have to make sure yeah. you, you, you have the right system. Um, you'd have to think about your insurance, your travel insurance. Would that actually cover you? Lots of people are putting terms, or terms in their terms and conditions that are saying in the event of a no deal Brexit, we won't cover you. So you have to check that very yeah. carefully. Mobile roaming charges might go up. Um, and a really important one, um, we currently have the benefit of the European Health Insurance Card, which allows yeah. us to access cheap yeah. uh, cheap medical care in the EU. That will go in the event of a no-deal Brexit. So really check, check your so insurance. you need the insurance care. to cover that. Yeah. Um, what about regulations that cover issues such as food labelling? And what will happen to the EU protected designation of origin and protected geographical indication rules that apply to products such as Cumberland sausage. Yeah, we can add to that the traditional specialities guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Uh, a, a, another protection that um, that uh, uh, certain products have. Uh, in the event of a no deal, the UK government has said that it will set up its own scheme, mm-hmm. so that gives you some protection. But obviously, that would protect these designations within the UK. It mm-hmm. would protect the designations. EU wide, so you'd rather be in an EU wide scheme. Who knows what will happen with um, uh, a no deal, but I, but I believe um, that the parties suggest that um, post um, uh, post a no deal Brexit, if your protection exists currently, so if there's a protection of government sausage, it will continue to exist in the EU, oh, right. which yeah. is great. Um, so long as it subsists. So if something would happen, it would be taken away, then you would lose that in the EU. Um, so protection is in place, deal or no deal, I think. Um, we talked briefly there about food labelling. This is probably where, um, if you were a food producer, you'd more likely to be kept awake at night. And we go back to that piece about um, being outside single market regulations and um, being exposed to goods from other countries. What you might find happens in the event of a, say, uh, a free trade agreement with the US is that um, American producers pressure Donald Trump to uh, negotiate a lower food standard so it's cheaper to produce food. That's allowed into the UK. What then happens to UK food producers? Well, do they keep producing to a high standard because they want to export to the EU? Do they lower yeah. their standards yeah. because they don't want to be to undercut compete. by... Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, do they uh, 
produce two sets of products. So labeling yeah. requirements, yeah. a lot of companies might actually have to have a label for the EU, yeah. a label for the UK, US yeah. market. Yeah. And, and that's not just food, that's, that could literally be any, any industry. Right. Uh, do you anticipate any changes to the rules around trademarks and intellectual property? So, again, in the event of a no deal, the UK have said that they will introduce an equivalent scheme. If you have IP that's protected in Europe, so, for example, a European trademark or a European design right, that will continue to be protected so long as you keep those protections up. And and, and the UK scheme will um, allow you to register the same protections in the UK. So so that should be absolutely fine. Um, Again... The real key to this is looking at the technical notices the government have released. IP is a f- phenomenally complicated area of the law, especially to design rights, registered designs, unregistered designs, trademark, copyright, so on and so forth. Um, and as Brexit Day draws closer, people who rely on IP, people who um, rely on IP for, for the subsistence of their business, need very carefully to understand what's going to go on with this. But they will only know that by keeping an eye on those technical notices, because unfortunately that is all subject to change even now. All right. And data protection. I mean, the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, that came in last year, was was an EU initiative. Yep. Will that change at all? Uh, Yes and no. Uh, Not in a way that's going to affect anyone, I don't think. Um, So the GDPR um, was a piece of legislation with direct effect. So essentially it came into our legislation as it came from the EU and that's why we've got the Data Protection Act 2018. That's fine. What the UK government have said is that anything from UK law, uh, sorry from EU law that comes into UK law like the GDPR will essentially just be copied and pasted from March 29th to March 30th. So post Brexit we're going to have exactly the same rules. It doesn't matter where they came from. The GDPR is British law now, so it will remain. So you'll have to keep up with all the standards and procedures and processes that the GDPR, the Data Protection Act 2018, um, insists that we have. However, in the event of a no deal, we'll obviously be outside the EU, and the EU will look at us and think, well, it's possible that the UK will diverge. Whether that happens straight away or over time, who knows. But what the EU will be entitled to do is say, well, actually, we could, if we wanted, stop a data flow from the UK because yeah. you're outside. Yeah. So what they'll do is they'll do a, uh, a finding of adequacy, which basically means they'll look at the UK um, and they'll say, right, we think your data protection procedures are good enough mm. to comply so that data flows are safe mm. between two countries. Now, that's a very easy thing to do mm. because we comply with the GDPR. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this will come down to um, how quickly the UK and the EU move in the event of a no deal. And I would imagine if it becomes obvious we're about to have a no deal, there will be instant movement on this because it's just too important for both parties. So uh, technically... It could cause a problem. Practically, it won't. It's unlikely to, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we have on the chamber website uh, links to various sources of, of advice on Brexit, um, Brexit planning. There's, mm-hmm. a, there's a good diagnostic tool. Yep. There's a specific advice on No Deal contingency planning. Yep. Uh, there's a link to the government's Prepare for EU exit website and the British Chambers of Commerce's Brexit Hub. Yep. Are there any other websites that, that you'd recommend? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we've talked a little bit about technical notices today, and I think that's mm. what you're referring to there. Um, the technical notices are consumer-facing and mm. useful, and they're not too legalistic. They're well worth looking at, and there will be something that covers your business. Mm. And the Institute of Directors are excellent. Mm. Um, we've mentioned the CBI. Um, but what I'd really do is urge people to look beyond the print media and websites and and, and try and plug into things like this, into podcasts, because I think part of the problem that we certainly find is that there's a lack of detail and a lack of nuance in the debate, and a lot of the print media just don't have the the capacity and the space to talk about these things. So some fantastic podcasts out there. Uh, The BBC would do one called Brexit Cast, um, which is is, superb. Um, RTE have an excellent one, Mm -hmm. Tony Connolly, Mm -hmm. um, which is called Brexit Republic. Mm -hmm. Um, Brexit Unspun, which is the Financial Times one. There are absolutely loads, but try and listen to things in more detail. And Mm -hmm. obviously the Chambers of Commerce. 
Yes, of course. Of course. Immerse, immerse of yourself, course. I think, is the, is the, is the message. Yes. Uh, and how can Muckle help businesses prepare? What can you do? There's a whole range of things. I mean, some of the things we've talked about today, we've talked about the possibility of setting up mm. a subsidiary. You'd need a corporate mm. lawyer. We can help you with that. Employment, we've talked about. Workers' rights, redundancies, restructuring. Mm. We can help you with your employment law issues. And banking, we can help arrange finance for companies. Property, the sale of leases and premises. But I think most people's work will be with a commercial team of lawyers. So your commercial team are the lawyers who deal with the day-to-day running of your business. And again, if we go back to that business audit that we talked about right at the start, one of the key things you can do is look at your contracts and try and work out whether your contracts are helpful or unhelpful. So do you have a termination provision that where you can say, we call it termination for convenience, either party can terminate on a month's notice without clause? Mm. Well, if you do, that's going to help you in the event that things go difficult. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Mm. Um, perhaps you've got a, a, what we call a force majeure or a material adverse change mm. clause that helps you in similar circumstances. Perhaps you have none of those things and you need to renegotiate your contracts. That's the point at which you need to get your lawyers involved. And they'll help you look at your contracts and work out what you need to do, if anything, to get ready for Brexit. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Luke. And, and if, if this podcast has wet, whetted your appetite for more, um, Muckle and Cumbria Chamber are running a Brexit breakfast briefing at Carlisle Racecourse on Thursday, February 28th, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. This is a free event and you can register to attend on the Chamber website, www.cumbriachamber.co.uk. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Cumbria Chamber of Commerce podcast. You can find out more about how we're supporting Cumbrian businesses at cumbriachamber.co.uk and cumbriagrowthhub.co.uk. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening and we'll have another episode for you next week.